I'm Mark Stickton, and this is The Service Design Show. In The Service Design Show, we talk to people that are shaping the service design field about the current state of the industry and the exciting new developments. Today, our guest is Mark Stickdorn. Probably a lot of you already know Mark because he's the uh, editor and co-author of this book called This is Service Design Thinking. Um, Mark is also doing two service design related startups called Smeply and Experience Fellow. And some of you may already have seen him uh, during a presentation or a talk he gives all around the world. Welcome to the show, Mark. Thank you. Was that a good introduction? Was that uh, sort was of perfect. correct? Thank you. It was great. Mm. Short and snappy. I like that. Short and snappy. <clears throat> Mark, uh, I'm going to ask this question to uh, all of my uh, uh, guests. What was your first memory of service design? What was the first moment you got in touch with service design? <laughs> well, I was um, I was working in uh, in the tourism industry uh, doing innovation projects, and I was struggling with the, um, the way I was teached, I was educated about uh, innovation in my classic management education because I studied strategic management, which was pretty linear thinking, linear tools of so stuff like uh, well, you have an idea, first you need to do write a business plan and then execute. And, and I failed really hard again and again doing that. Right. And, and when I then heard first time about design thinking, service design, I got really intrigued, and it felt to me like a like like a boy opening a box of toys because suddenly I had names for stuff I was doing, but I caught it differently. Um, and I realized that the way I sneaked through a project actually wasn't sneaking through a project. It was just iterating, but I didn't know that I was iterating at that time. I was thinking I was failing all the time. Right. Um, and then, well, I got really intrigued in that and I, I learned more and more. And, and do you actually, can you recall the speaker or the article, the book that you touched and, and uh, found the subject? I'm, I can't recall really. Mm. Uh, but I think it was, no, I can't. It, it was 2007, that's for sure. And um, it was related uh, to tourism because I was working in the tourism industry. And, and there was, I don't know where I read an article about design thinking. I got really interested in that. I moved to Austria where I started working at the SCI business school here. Um, where one of my projects was actually uh, service design, teaching service design, having research project in that, and and that was the moment when I when I really started researching in depth about that. So not only practicing it, even though calling it differently, but then really digging into um, the heritage of professor. I was, yeah. Well, I'm I'm still, but at like a junk professor. So I'm just at a university for a few days. Right, Mark. Um... Let's go on to uh, the, the topics you uh, pointed me to. Uh, we have found a format to actually make this into a co-creation session because in, because in service design we love co-creation and believe in the power of co-creation. So we're also going to co-create the show, sort of. Um, <clears throat> let us explain the format, how it works, right? I, uh, I have a topic right here and I'll hold it up and you have a different stack of papers, right? That's right. So you have a different stack of papers and your papers uh, start with a question starter. I'll give you a topic, you'll pick a question starter and then you can ramble on the topic, uh, whatever you like. And then we'll continue from that. <laughs> Perfect. Easy, right? Okay, so let's just uh, uh, jump right in and uh, I'll pick um, this one because this is probably a topic a lot of service designers can relate to. This is service design, design thinking, UX, customer experience, interaction design, and a lot of other design disciplines. Yeah, let me... How do you, how do you counter that? Oh, I picked that one. I picked one. Why? Why what? Why the heck do we have so many names for doing more or less the same thing, which is design? 
um, I, I think it's it's really strange because we're having so many discussions right now going on on defining what exactly is design thinking compared to service design, compared to UX design, and so on and so forth. Where in practice, what we're trying to do in organizations is we're trying to break down silos. We try to connect different departments. We're trying to connect people. We're trying to co-create, like you said, we're doing this show. But then at the same time, in our little bubbles of design thinking service design, we're building up silos again and saying, oh, no, this is not part of, of service design. This is part of design thinking or this, this is part of UX or this is part of CX and what the heck. I don't understand it. I don't get it. I don't know why the heck we're building up new silos when we all follow a similar iterative process, maybe with different, slightly different tool sets, whatever, but it's all ribbon mix anyway. So, my, well, my, my question would be is who is creating these silos? Is it the designers or is it the outside world trying to understand design and put it into something they can put in a box? I think it's both. Um, of, of course, if people like to learn about that and they hear different phrases, they like to understand what's the difference. And, and it doesn't really make sense if you're new to something why you have different labels which appear a very similar thing. Um, and then, of course, you have uh, the practitioners, um, agencies, in-house departments. And I see two different approaches there. So on the one hand, you have the agencies who say, we don't care how you call it because yeah. Basically, yeah. all our clients are calling it differently anyway, depending on the organization and culture. Um, so we don't give a damn how you, how you, like which label you put on it. But then, of course, you have other agencies and, and in-house departments who already built up a reputation in a specific field and they like to defend their own field, saying, oh, no, this is service design or this is UX and, and not design thinking and... I, I can understand both sides, but I think as a community, it, we, would, we would really grow much easier. We can learn much easier from another when we get rid of these language barriers. Well, <clears throat> final question about this, because what do you think needs to happen to break down the silos within design? I, I don't know. I, I think that... that I mean, on the one hand, there will be always buzzwords, right? And, and design thinking, service design nowadays is a buzzword. And now that... Ooh, base... the, the, the bold statement. <laughs> well, well, it is like that. If you take a look at all the, the business consultancies, they are all saying they're doing it now, exactly. right? Yeah. So definitely it is a buzzword. And if, if Harvard Business Review titles design thinking comes out of age, yeah. Yeah, they, uh, I mean, it's we, we a lot see of attention. That's let's we, we agree on that. Yeah, so I think we have to look beyond the buzzwords to understand rather what is the process, what is the tool set, how do we work, what is the culture, and that is more important than just the label of it. And if we agree on that, that it doesn't really matter which label you put in that, um, but look beyond that to understand what is the process and how do we work together, then we can really really proceed. We need more collaboration instead of uh, <clears throat> more definitions. Exactly, exactly. And I think having a, a good discussion on how we work is much more value, uh, valuable than having a discussion on how we call how we, what we're doing. Well, let's, let's use the show for that on, uh, to discuss how we work because I agree, uh, I agree with you. Mark, uh, let's move on to the second topic. All right. I'll, um, I'll pick uh, this one. It's called research in practice. Yeah. What do you Let want me... to do with that? Well, as, as I have so many um, question starters here, let me try to pick one randomly. So I don't know what, what the question is going to be. I just pack, pick this one. Let's see what it is. When will when will we finally do really good research in practice? <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> well, often I see so so my background is partly academic, partly in practice. So I really try to connect both worlds. And then my background is also in management. So I got trained a lot in quantitative tools. 
before I moved into design and learned more and more about qualitative ethnographic approaches. Um, and what I see is that many companies nowadays use service design, however you call that, I call it service design, um, sometimes as an excuse to do bad research because they say, oh, it's just, just service design, we just need some qualitative research. So they, they go out, do a few interviews, they come back and say, okay, that's, that's what it is. Mm -hmm. And th that's not really valuable. So you can then base design decisions on really wrong assumptions because they only come back to prove their assumptions, what they already had. They just do a little bit of research, heavily biased, and mm -hmm. then they develop products which suits their own need not the need of the customer because I didn't really understand. So, so it's like using just research for checking a box rather than actually doing proper research. Exactly. Mm -hmm. exactly. So I, I think just as an example, even if you, if a large organization tries, it's really hard to do that. They sometimes plan design research with a gun chart. So I've been in a project where they had a huge whiteboard. Every morning they had a meeting with a team of almost 15 researchers where they said, okay, we need 500 interviews. We need 300 in-house visits. We need, and so on. And they just tick boxes. So, okay, let, let's try to get 10 more today. So we're done without even looking at the data. So for a few months, they were only collecting data without looking at the data. and. At some point, they, were, they started to drown in data, and then we're looking for approaches, how can we actually analyze it now, now that we have like 500 interviews, 300 in-house visits. And if you, if you have an academic approach in there, you know that actually this approach is useless, because in qualitative research, what you're looking for is theoretical saturation. You want to find, for example, the five biggest bugs in your customer experience, if we talk about an existing yeah, experience. Yeah. And once you got it and further interviews, further observations only prove what you already know, there's no need in doing further interviews anymore. So I, I really recognize what you're saying. And I think it has a lot to do with people actually going into design research with a validating mindset rather than an explorative mindset. Yeah. Is that something you recognize yeah. too? Absolutely, absolutely. And I, I think also in design, there is a place to, to validate um, sure. moments. So if, you, if we think of prototyping, the whole idea of prototyping is, of course, to test things. So we, we have a list of, of topics we need to validate. We have hypotheses, assumptions, and we need to test them. And that makes sense. Yeah, but yeah. the beginning of a project where you rather need explorative stuff, doesn't make sense. So I think there's, there's often a culture clash and people sometimes use an excuse to do less research and sometimes they still use the same mindset, the same framework they use from quantitative fields, just applying it in qualitative yeah. field. I think we need, we need a better education. Here. Yeah, and this is really a hard topic because it re really requi requires different culture, different mindset, and uh, it's about embracing uncertainty which is really hard if you're in a surrounding that it's about it's about Gantt charts and predicting how many interviews will do. Absolutely. So, so uh, any any ideas on how we can move a step beyond the current research methods? Well, what I think, what I see in 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 business and academia right now is that there is actually a trend away from only focusing quantitative stuff uh, to mixed method approaches where you mix quant and qual or really to, to different qualitative approaches. And now with increasing technology, um, it becomes also much, much more accessible for, for companies because you, if you have snippets of videos from users, for example, if, if you um, have videos of observations, in-house um, visits and so on, it's often much more powerful to see a customer failing uh, using your product or service uh, than having statistics about how customers are failing. And I think we need both. We need to prove, yes, this is a real issue, but then we need the qualitative bits and pieces proving or showing why actually they feel. And I think 
these mixed method approaches get industry is getting that, and I think education is moving along with that, and it will be just a matter of time. Yeah. I think uh, it will be a, a very good step if orga organizations would just be a bit, a little bit more patient in their research and not jumping on the assumptions from the head start. Just patience. Patience would be a, a, a good, a good cure, I think, for better, better design research. Well, time is money, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, go slow to go fast. Uh, I'm not sure who that uh, said that, but go slow to go fast. Exactly, exactly. Uh, Mark, you already hinted about something uh, using new technology and new tools. Let's move on to uh, the final topic, and it's called tools and software. Tools and software. Let me um, let me let me pick. I like that. How much? How much? So I'm not going to answer how much that costs, <laughs> but I'm going to answer uh, how much technology, tools, and software do we actually need in, in service design. And um, you, you mentioned that in the beginning. I, with our, our company, we moved away from doing projects, and we really focus now on uh, developing tools and software for service design. That's what we're doing with both our startups, Mapped and Experience Fellow. And we are totally aware that there won't be a software who can solve everything. But I think there are a few problems companies always struggle with where specific software makes sense. So how much do we need? Definitely, we don't need any technology when we do workshops. Because mm -hmm. I think hands-on workshops, hands-on prototyping session, uh, journey mapping session with pen and paper, this is absolutely gold, and there won't be an exchange for that. Um, of course, collaboration tools help if you don't get a team in one room. Um, so before you don't do anything, do it virtually, fair enough. But I think a face-to-face -face workshop is still the way to go. However, there are these moments after a workshop uh, where, you, where you have your walls plastered with paper templates and posters. We all know, and we all know those situations. Exactly. So th that is what we try to tackle then with, with Smaply, with the software to quickly progress afterwards, where you can print it out again, but then it should always connect the hands-on pen and paper work with the digital. The digital should always be a level on top which helps you, well, which makes your life easier. That's the whole idea of it. And I think we shouldn't try to get rid of the hands-on work, really. In... Do, you, do you think designers are a bit scared to use technology? I, no, I don't think they're scared. I think we love technology, actually. Um, but one of the key things in service design is, or the key skills for me, is actually facilitation. So how do you work in a, you know, how do you moderate a workshop? How do you set up the workshop? How do you create an experience that people within the room feel safe and are open enough to share and, and try out things. And technology won't help you there. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's a human yeah. skill. Yeah. And I think we don't need to be scared of technology there, but we need to use it in that moment where it makes sense. Um, we'll, we'll put some links uh, to your tools uh, in the description of this video, because I, I hope a lot of people will just give it a go and give it a try and see how it enriches their process. I think that's really valuable. Well, I don't want to make a sales pitch here. So, well, uh, uh, not well, I'll, I'll, I'll do it for you. We'll put, the links, uh, we'll put the links in the description. Perfect, thank you. What, what, what is the biggest challenge developing tools and software for service designers? It's, I think it's the same as every startup. We, we got the same issues. I mean, um, financials, so one startup we finance, we bootstrap, so we, we finance it out of our own pockets, we finance it through our project and was just developing part of it. At some point it needs more attention, which again means you can do less projects, you really need to focus on them, and that's what we're doing now. So we stopped doing service design projects, I still do my talks, my, my workshops, I train the trainer workshops and stuff. But I don't do service design projects anymore because we really want to, or we really need to focus on developing the tools. And then you have all the, the classic issues. You have a small team 
uh, limited budget, you have a huge roadmap of features you want to put in there. Um, you want to create a great experience. You don't have the time and money to do everything right from the beginning. So definitely we are failing. Um, but I think we are pretty open about that and we communicate that. So we really live the service line spirit of co-creating with our customers, having um, usability sessions, we talk a lot with them, incorporating that. So we, we, I think agile development process merges perfectly with the service design process. So we talk about customer experience sprints yeah, yeah. where we do research, we put into the development, we launch it, and we start all over again every two weeks, basically. Is there a way um, uh, the viewers of this video can help out in any way creating better software? Can you, can you repeat the question? So yeah, didn't sure. Um, you're, you said you were involving uh, users and actually practitioners in the development. Is there a way people who are watching this video right now can participate? Well, sure. Um, basically, everybody can participate. So um, you, can, you can sign up for free for, for 14 days. And even just in the trial period, um, try it out and give us feedback. So either schedule uh, a call with us, schedule a usability session with us, where you share your screen and we watch you working with that. Um, schedule a session where we talk through how you use it in a workshop or after a workshop and what worked, what didn't work. And through that, we are developing us further. And we're doing that a couple of times a week, actually, having these sessions. Okay. Uh, good to know. And the final thing about software is uh, I'm really curious to see new software and tools coming up and uh, experience in which phase of the design process it will be. Like you already said, it probably won't be in the works of facilitation. Um, will it be in the research phase? Will it be in the analysis phase? Probably in, in both, but I'm really curious to see what happens in, um, in that yeah. field. I think it's, it's, it's a great development because we can see that already that there is more and more different software coming up, um, very specialized to very specialized topics. And for me, it's also interesting because I think we as a, as a service and community can use that to get a step or to get a foot in the door uh, to companies. Why? Now that um, research companies like Forrester, for example, put out reports on software, available software for customer journey mapping. What we realized is that companies start, or they, they, they don't care, they just buy the software. They start using that. At some point, they realized, yeah, this is a software. Uh, okay, I can do a journey map, but how do I get to the data to it? Right, right. And suddenly they reach out to, to us and ask us, well, look, how does it work? And we say, well, maybe you should actually work with uh, one of your local service design agencies. Um, get some training in that and, and maybe do a project with them because it's, it's just a piece of software. It's right. like yeah. Excel yeah. or Word doesn't help you to write a book. You still need to do it. Interesting, and, uh, interesting thought and I think you're, you're uh, spot on there. It, it makes it really uh, uh, easier for companies to jump on the bandwagon of customer experience, customer journeys, research and then they open Pandora's box, they don't know what they've started and uh, Absolutely. Need, need help. So a lot of my, when I talk at conferences, I, I speak a lot at, at UX management conferences. Um, in a few weeks, I was speaking at a, at a leadership conference at Harvard Business School, which is crazy that they invite somebody to talk about service design. Now. And what I'm telling there always is, is stuff like a customer journey map is not a fucking deliverable. And because that's what many, many think. We, we buy this software, we do a journey map, and then we're done. No, you're not. And that they should base their journey map on research and not just assumptions. So a lot of my talks, I try to educate them. And I try, well, not educate, but at least give them the hint that awareness, I guess. working just assumption-based is not the right way to do that. And they're going to fail by doing that. And I hope that through that, we will grow the, the whole service design community even more. Thank you for your co contribution to the service design uh, community so far to the software. Mark, um, we're sort of heading into the final phase of, uh, of our talk. The question I want to ask you is people that want to get into service design, people that want to start with service design, what is the 
single most valuable tip you would give them? Don't try to learn it out of a book. I mean, I'm, I'm guilty with that myself, uh, with the book I did with Jacob. But we designed it as a textbook, not as a go-to research and a resource. So my single most valuable tip for that is if you really want to learn about service design, join one of your local global service jams. But I think that is a, a worldwide non-for-profit event um, where you can learn how to, or you can experience in a, in a kind of pressure cooking format in 48 hours how this process works. You learn new people. I think that's one of the best ways to get into service design. Awesome. Um, is there a, a question you would like to ask the audience, the viewers, a question that you have yourself and that we will uh, give the opportunity for people to comment on on this video? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Should. Well, with, with our new focus now that we really stepped, like we, we took a step back. We're, we're not an agency. We don't do projects. We really want to create tools and software for you guys doing service design out there. Um, we already have a few products now out there, but it won't end there. So we have loads of ideas of what else we could do. So my question to the community would be, what do you need? What, what do you really struggle with when there's not yet a solution and you would like somebody to, to take this task and, and develop something to help you? Well, we'll see what comes up. I think I'm curious. struggle, struggle uh, with a lot of things. So, um, Mark, uh, thank you for your time. And it was uh, awesome talking to you. Thanks for taking the time to be part of the, of the service design show and a concept we are still developing. What are your thoughts about the topics we discussed today? And if you have any suggestions on who we should invite next to the show, be sure to let us know down below in the comments. If you enjoyed this episode and like to see more interviews with service design pioneers, subscribe to our channel and check out some of the past episodes. With the Service Design Show, we help you to stay one step ahead within service design by talking to the people that are actually shaping the field. For now, thanks for watching.